you can call it the investing masterclass. I've been an investor for about um, 19 years now. Been through three different market crashes, including 2008, 2010 flash crash, and of course COVID-19. What we can say is that we have uh, beat the S&P quite well over 20 years. The last year was. It doesn't mean that every pick we made has been a winner. We've had some that didn't win. Mm. The other our wins are better than our losses. The most annoying loss so far is I have a rule if doing like 180% return on meta. It is not a loss until you sell. A decision not to sell is a decision to buy in a way because there's something called opportunity cost. When I said I don't hold more than 6 to 10 at a time. Are we, are we in a bubble? <laughs> when, when is this video going to come out? For those that are new here, I have with me MoneyWise Doctor, Dr. Egwin, and we're going to be having a very interesting chat, and today is all about investing, you can call it the Investing Masterclass. So if you've not binged our playlist, this is one episode that you also want to watch or listen to if you're listening on podcast. And before we would continue, we just want Dr. Egwin to just quickly introduce himself and just talk about basically how he got into investing <laughs> well thank you for inviting me back i think it's my second time here on the channel and uh, yes i had... should come more <laughs> we've had uh, many interesting discussions out th- oh, maybe we should have recorded oh, this was a nice one um yeah so basically i'm uh, dr ndbc andy Green. Uh, I'm the founder of MoneyWiseDoctor.com. It's a platform that helps doctors make smarter financial decisions. Uh, my background is I've been an investor for about um, 19 years now. I think I started investing at about wow. roughly 19. And um, I started not knowing what I was doing along the line. I started figuring out how to analyze stocks, individual stocks. Been through three different market crashes, including 2008, 2010 flash crash, and of course, COVID-19. And there's been many other market ups and downs since then. And uh, yeah, we've had uh, really quite decent returns, or what Benjamin Graham will call uh, satisfactory returns. <laughs> no, what, we, what we can say is that we have uh, beat the S&P quite well over 20 years with a very, 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 very good returns. But why I'm give not... Us, quick... give, give, give us a range. Okay, I could give you for the last year, the last year was 87% returns. Ah. So, but we've had years that was better. I should, I should give you my money. Yeah. No, but yeah, here, is, here is the thing. Once you start managing more money, your returns go down. It happens to them um, before it happens to everybody. Because then you take fewer risks and yeah, you obviously have other things that you have to deal with. Um, Yeah, so I would say in the last, probably if we look at annualized returns for the past four years, we're hovering around 61% roughly. And our lives wow. returns, and if we go That's back good. all the way to ninety years, uh, sorry, nineteen years, um, it's because it's investing across different countries. Um, I think we might work it out around fifty-two percent. But again, th- these numbers depend on how you look at them. But if you are calculating and you are factoring in the dividend in the returns, and if mm. you are factoring it across different currencies, uh, because we always want to adjust adjust it to the currencies and and you know use the us dollar as the baseline yeah that, that makes sense that makes sense and i know recently you did a program where a lot of people in your community they go go involved and you i think it's still on right where you taught people about the basics of investing <laughs> yeah <laughs> all other things how to pick stocks everything about investing why is investing important why, why do you think it's important why are you teaching doctors and a lot of people about investing yeah i mean basically this master class is previously i had people one-on-one discuss uh, individual stuff but they, they were i just couldn't handle the number of people who wanted to learn about investing but like you know you're very you're very um studied in this area there's not very much you can teach in 30 minutes or one hour so that's yeah. part of what we put on that master class i would thought look your best bet as a doctor or healthcare professional your best bet is probably to buy index funds because if you're not ready to have the time to dedicate to analyze companies look at businesses understand their underlying numbers and the underlying business then make a decision which may or may not be right because 
if I if I say I get this type of returns I'm mentioning here, it doesn't mean that every pick we made has been a winner. We've had some that didn't win. Mm. Yeah, that our wins are better than our losses. Now, for an average doctor or healthcare professional who is really busy, I say you're too busy. Maybe think about an index fund. But there are people who say no. Um, you're doing it. You don't have two heads. There are other people who are doing it. And I'll say, okay, in that case, you need to be properly trained. Just like you say to somebody, you want to learn about health, just watch a few YouTube. But you want to become a doctor. You want to be a professional. You <laughs> want to become, you, you know, this is like DIY investing, but you still have to do yeah. your 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 homework. You see me like last earlier this year, not even last year. I was in Omaha. I was in Nebraska for Warren Buffett show yeah. I'm meeting. Like, why why do I have to join investment calls, read 10 Ks and reports? If you buy index funds, you don't have to do any of that despite all that discouragement i had people who said i want to learn how to do fundamental analysis and that's why we put on that class and that's why it's so long it's a four-week program uh but so far it's been fantastic and i i, I enjoy them the energy from the people in the room they're very enthusiastic but you know what they say those who pay pay attention <laughs> <laughs> that's true there are two things i just wanted you to if you can share with us, I said you've had some wins, you've had some losses. Which stock um, have been your most memorable loss and which <laughs> one has been your most memorable win? Easy. That... The most memorable loss is easy to remember. They're usually the most painful ones. I'll say it's Alibaba. So Alibaba, oh, wow. Alibaba <laughs> is, is still not a permanent loss, right? Because I haven't sold it. But yeah. it's, it's the one that has performed worse than I thought it would. Um, but I've held this for, um, I think, two years now, going to three. And I have a rule. If I've done my homework, I've done my research, um, I don't tend to sell a stock in less than two or three years. If I've done a proper analysis, looked at the company, obviously, the Alibaba has some risk, government risk and all that stuff yeah. Um, yeah. to consider. But it's also a marvelous business. Their next quarterly report will come out in November. So the last quarter, they did all right. They beat their forecast. Um, two quarters before then they miss their forecast but it's generally quite a good business they just have some issues going on and i'm, I'm very reluctant to let go of it but currently i think it's um, about 18 percent down from when we got in um but, okay. but again that's that's when you look at other things when you look at something like uh, you asked me about my biggest win so far you look at something uh recently we look at um something like uh meta meta we're doing like 180 percent return on meta and um, we've held it for about two and a half years now um look at something like alphabet we've held, held it for about a year and a half and we've done like 34 percent on it and look at something like coinbase which we thought was absolutely not going to do too well and we're very careful our sizing was not that high and it's done 22 percent so far so so that's why basically you you have to do the work and then you have to do your asset allocation and risk management so that even if you are wrong mm. you know that might you also have to have that margin of safety so that if you are wrong it's not a disaster you can still yeah. you know yeah. you're all right but that doesn't mean you don't have to do the actual homework and may i mention none of the stocks i mentioned here is not a recommendation to buy anything yeah th and that, that's very true this is not a recommendation this is just them um, two guys or two <laughs> friends talking on the internet so <laughs> I, I was yeah. going to say, um yeah so these are like more recent ones i remember during covid there were like companies like banks in nigeria like i remember uba at some point we held like was it a million units then and um basically some of them just tripled or quadrupled within like after covid the economy recovered and um, i remember one called united capital ucap which mm. i remember my my friend got in then at 50 kobo which is basically the nigerian currency i think ucap is about 18 naira now they're about wow yeah <laughs> when i got, when i got in it was two naira 50 kobo i was like oh but when I analyze it, it was still a good buy. So the thing is, like, before you go buy individual stock, you don't buy it because it's going up or going down. You're buying it because what is the company doing? What is their free cash flow? What is their debt to asset ratio? What is the story about this company? Why do you think it's going to be a good company in the future? Can you hold it 20 years? If the stock market was short for the next five years, would you still be happy? 
to hold it. These are these are some things. So, but you realize that most people who are buying individual stocks, they don't even know about these numbers. And that's something in my class. People are like, why wow, is that how? Is that what multiples mean? Is that what PE ratio means? Because in the past, people were just like, oh, this one sounds like a good one. They're going to space. Let's buy it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something that you mentioned with your Alibaba stock. You said that um, you've not crystallized that loss. Yes. And I, for me, that's something that I've seen a lot of people that that is a big mistake or misconception that a lot of people um, have with investing. You've invested your money and right there on the app or the investment platform, you can see the big red negative <laughs> that, the, the, <laughs> that the thing is down by so so and you just feel like the the stock or the ETF or whatever it is is already a loss. But that point that you made is something that I really tell people like it is not a loss until you sell. Is there any other misconception that you would that you from your interaction with people? that people have about investing um yeah actually there are lots i mean after 19 years of doing this and now because i run money wise doctor i'm communicating with thousands of doctors weekly you hear all sorts of strange things and i don't know bad shit crazy things people think and say that don't sound rational but you understand human beings are not just rational we're also emotional yeah yeah when you see that red thing is red for your purpose and your, your mind <laughs> Even like for instance, I, I've given you, I've given you a clear examples of where we've done like one eighty percent, thirty four percent, but the eighteen percent one is more painful because we have loss aversion. Is that what psychologists call it? When we yeah. when we lose a bit of money, is more painful. So people are likely to feel more, um, you know, they might feel worse about a negative, you know, situation despite the fact that they're outweighing. Uh, positive outcomes um but yeah so most time people say no i've lost money but till you sell it you've not actually you know you've not you've not actually harvested you've not taken that loss basically until yeah. you sell it yeah um that being said there's something i obviously for a sophisticated investor there's something you have to acknowledge as well a decision not to sell is a decision to buy in a way because there's something called opportunity cost. Mm. If you've got like let's say ten thousand or twenty thousand, let's just use ten thousand in a stock, and you're deciding to hold it, that means you're believing that this company is good. They're either going to pay you dividend or they're going to do better in the future. If you don't sell it, the opportunity cost is that you could have that money could have been somewhere else. You could have actually been buying a bond or treasury bill or or just another investment or just spend it on yourself. Yeah. So if you decide not to sell and you say, well, I haven't sold, so it's not a permanent loss. That is true. And that is psychologically nice, but just realize that there's a true cost for not selling. So I'm yeah, not holding, yeah. I don't hold the stock because I think, oh, it's nice. I'm going to wait. It's because I'm thinking, okay, there's still some um, light basically from the company. They're doing quite well. Look at the economic activity inside the company, their numbers and all that. Uh, again, I think sometimes you have heuristics, like you make up rules that you use that to guide you. And for me, one of it is that I don't buy something and then sell it within two or three years. I have to wait to prove out that theory. Uh, except something happens, there's a case of fraud or things come out. As long as the company is still doing what I thought it would do, is increasing its market share, is increasing its profit, is it reducing its operating cost, or even if it's increasing operating cost, it's probably investing in plants or doing stuff. Maybe sometimes the dividend is growing, or maybe they don't pay dividend, but their earning per share is still growing. So I tend to think, well, I'm going to wait it out. That also means that I don't just buy randomly because I know that this is a bit of a marriage now. It's not yeah. like a, a one night fling. So I'm, I'm very likely to be very, very careful in my assessment. And that's why when we move in, somebody has seen some of, I think someone in our group saw um, our position size. I was like, really, you really invested that amount? Uh, you asked me once why I'm holding not more than six to 10 stocks at the time. I'm like, yeah. well, because before we go in, we actually do quite a bit of work to go in there. And if you look at other examples, you see people like Warren Buffett, 
they're not holding 500 stocks at the time no they're holding a number of stocks but not like they're not buying the whole market uh but if you want to buy the whole market just buy an index fund and just know that you're going for the maximum diversification give me an example of what you would see um in a stock that would make you break your two-year rule for example like um, because you've mentioned that quite a lot and i'm just thinking in my head has it happened before and um, did you see something or if not what is that um scenario that you have in your head that would make you hmm. i don't think i've had i think there was um, a company once that i started entering started buying and it turned out that okay they had this major coming up and then the major fell through um i didn't lose money on that one but on the long term i can't really think of any other company that i've held for less than two years in fact when i said i started investing um at about 19 the stock i bought then i still have it um wow yeah we, 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 which stock is that vita microsoft vita phone oh. <laughs> yeah i'll tell you how long ago it was and it, it's, oh, it's, wow. it wasn't a lot of money it's about less than a thousand naira then so <laughs> it tells you that was like my first journey then i kept investing more then you got to the point you go from a thousand to a hundred thousand and then you go from a hundred thousand to you know an interesting question why vita phone instead of mocha phone you will not believe it <laughs> 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 it was the cheapest thing my little money could buy <laughs> as a broke teenager <laughs> I was like, well, if I buy it for four naira, whatever it is back then, I'll be able to buy maybe two and a half to share that. <laughs> what are the account for? That my stuff broke. I was going to um, take one of my kidneys, basically, <laughs> because half half of the money went to stuff broke. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, I see a lot of people these days buying stuff with trading to want to invest in gin or whatever platform this day it's so easy now fee. because they don't pay fees so people are more likely to lose money because they don't have to think too much mm. about the stock market <laughs> stock brokers fee and those if you want to invest they have to think will i make enough money to cover to the, make fees. Up for the <laughs> frictional cost fees and tax and all that <laughs> awesome awesome so um one thing that you spoke about um, briefly and i know it's something we've discussed off camera um, but you mentioned it is that you don't hold you hold you don't hold more than 10 stocks or between six it's something like that and that speaks to asset allocation how you think about it and um, what your percentages look like between each of those um companies can you just explain to people that um will be watching or listening what added asset allocation is and how do you think about it and how do you think um people should think about it that's, that's a very intelligent question obviously and i think it comes down to the key um to the root of risk management um obviously for myself when i said i don't hold more than six to ten at the time it wasn't on purpose it's me looking back now realizing that oh throughout um, this whole period I've always just held like less than six to ten and um, I realized I was just in line with the principles of you know Warren Buffett is no secret that I really look up to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and I see their, yeah. their sort of like approaches to put all your eggs in one basket or six baskets and watch it they're kind of like concentrated and they will tell you that diversification is for someone who doesn't know what they are doing so if you're buying individual stocks and you're buying 40, maybe you should just buy an index. And uh, Warren Buffett has a, a joke that if you have like, <laughs> do you say 20 wives or 30 wives, you probably don't know any of them really well or something like that. I can't remember. He has a lot of this type of things. <laughs> yeah, but basically what it is is that if you can research a good number of stocks, let's say 6 to 10, hold it that's great that's my own style i'm not able to research 50 stocks i don't have like um, mm. staff and i don't do it all day long um you have people like some of the great guys again i can't remember who is this guy that wrote that wrote uh beat beat the beat the street or something peter lynch yeah peter lynch, peter lynch okay so he was a mutual fund guy he, he buys like lots of stocks and that's his style because he this was his full-time job he was a fund manager he can follow all of them um, but my thing is that you shouldn't just buy things because everyone is buying it but when it comes to asset allocation basically what it means is that 
you want to just remove allocation and put sharing you want to share your investment port investment portfolio in such a way that a disaster in one does not mean like a disaster in the whole thing so basically yeah. you're trying to either you position yourself in a way that one investment does not correlate with the other one for instance when the re- property market is going down sometimes stock market is going up when the stock market is going up sometimes property market is not doing too well when buying stocks are a great idea bonds might not be paying that well and when bonds have fantastic returns stocks might actually not be doing great because when there's a market crash or market is not doing well investors flee and go for yeah. fixed, fixed income assets like bonds and treasury bills or guilt so guilt is basically bonds that's what we call it in the uk so that's guilt um if you want to know why they are called guilt we'll go into a bit of history but that's a long <laughs> story <laughs> but basically um asset allocation is trying to put out your investment in a way that um if one thing or one of the things you thought would go well doesn't go well that will not asset spell, sharing exactly that will not that will not spell a um, disaster for you that will not mean a blow up for you uh for instance let's just use a round number again i don't know which number your audience is familiar with whether i should use hundred thousand or one million but let's just say use hundred thousand a nice round number um mm. so if you if you're going to do asset allocation a hundred thousand let's say you had like maybe 50k in property because most people tend to put down quite a bit of money or let's just say 20k in property as part of the asset then you have 80k and you put 20k for in cash because the emergency fund which is basically um three to six months worth of your living expense that's not money for investing you put it aside for emergency i'm sure that your channel you must have a lot of yeah. emergency fund um then what you've got is 60 uh, 60 000 now because you put 20 in housing, you put 20 in emergency fund. So you have 60,000 and you decide, okay, out of this 60,000, this is the money that I'm going to invest. Or maybe you have another 10,000 you put towards wanting else, or, and then you have 50K. That 50K is your investment, it's part of the money you want to invest in stocks. You've already got an investment in property. You now want to invest this 50K in stocks. So even if you decide that, oh, I want to invest in only 10 stocks. Now you might decide that, okay, the maximum I'm going to put in any of these 10 stocks will be 5,000. It doesn't have mm. to be five. It doesn't have to be equally. But basically, if you have that rule again, it's rules that help you to avoid disaster. If you say, I'm not going to, and that's basically financial discipline. I'm not going to invest yeah. more than 5K. Oh, they say this stock is going to blow up. Like I, I have uh, some people in my class. I keep teasing them. I call them NVIDIA millionaires. Because some of them bought NVIDIA like three, four years ago, but but basically they didn't know how to analyze companies and all that. They were lucky they bought it. So now they are learning and they're like, oh, wow, this is what happened. I teased them. I called them NVIDIA millionaires. Um, basically, um, even if that stock you think is going to go to 1 million or 100 million, you decide, I'm not going to expose my portfolio to more than 10 percent of that amount so remember mm. yeah is that 50k now you're investing into the stock and i don't want to exceed 10 percent of it so that's one way to allocate assets or share assets you might also consider the whole portfolio the whole hundred thousand and think okay i'm not going to put more than 10 percent. so 10k becomes the maximum you can put in any individual stocks so if you're buying individual stocks one thing can happen sometimes the price keeps going down and if you don't know what you're doing, some people will tell you buy the deep. You keep going deeper and deeper and deeper till you're at the bottom of the ocean. Sometimes you're catching a falling knife. You don't know what you're doing, you're buying. Like when we're buying a uh, meta, it was falling, we're buying. We are looking at the number, you're buying. They're still making profit, we're buying. Facebook was growing. They bought WhatsApp. They had Instagram. They don't even monetize all these things. The market was still selling it because they lost money in that metaverse. Yeah. They lost like 10, yeah. not even lost. They spent 10 billion. Like they spent 10 billion, but what was the- People, um, no, people just didn't understand <laughs> um, the guy's vision with leaving your successful social media to go into one uh, they thought he was going like bad shit crazy <laughs> <laughs> okay let's assume that he, 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 he didn't know they didn't know what they were doing they lost 10 billion but what of the rest of the company how much did they make in their facebook where is the yeah. number one place people go to still you know do paper click is still meta and all that stuff 
yeah so that's why when it's going down we we'll look at the numbers at some point i think my wife say are you are you sure um, i mean i like i wife usually think okay as long as you're sure i just buy it so but sometimes people are just buying because they think oh is it is they think after after dark it becomes after darkness comes light that's the same but sometimes after yeah. darkness it becomes pitch black <laughs> <laughs> when it is the darkest it becomes very dark it becomes even darker <laughs> very dark so again the other aspect is going up when things are going up some people tend to just keep buying keep buying keep buying yeah so that's yeah. why you need that discipline of asset allocation if you need, have that discipline in place like okay I'm, i know i'm buying the deep but once it hits um once i've bought my allocation that 10 percent, that's it we've filled up our pot for that one we've got to look elsewhere if you don't do that you might make money you might get great returns but when you become a more mature investor when people make returns it's not interesting what you want to know is the amount of risk they took to make their returns you know because so, you know that things can go either way yeah so at the i want to the question i want to ask is regarding asset allocation and it has to do with when for example one of the stocks that you've bought decides mm. to do very well and it's seen as unbalanced your portfolio that your asset allocation is not right i just want to know what your thought is are you talking about asset allocation strictly based on the amount your purchase amount the amount you invested or are you talking about it in terms of your portfolio as a whole because you've bought five or ten stocks for example today in one year time um meta could account for 40 percent of your portfolio because they've done so well while um alibaba for example can drop to just one percent but you all in, you invested the same amount in i don't know if my question makes sense how do you look at it is it just for your price purchase price or the whole portfolio even factoring in growth and all of that your question makes absolute sense and it's such a brilliant question i mean some of these questions make all of us to think right because now yeah of course um but there are different approaches and there are different ways what is important is you have a rule that you follow have your own way in my own case i don't um i don't try too hard to rebalance my portfolio i try to focus more on exposure when i'm going in um okay. obviously if i find that something has grown and gotten to become half of my uh, portfolio i might decide to look at it again i'll look at it again but you, know, you don't sell your winners just because you want to just balance your portfolio um maybe if you need to pay a big bill like warren buffett recently sold some apples and he said it was to pay yeah. tax we don't know if it's to pay tax or because the market <laughs> is valid but but basically he did uh, sell something yeah, uh, but it's not where we focus. We focus on going in. Yeah, long term. Okay, that makes sense, and and it makes it very simple. To be honest, it just simplifies the whole thing. Um, yeah. Do you think the market is in a bubble? Um, are we are we in a bubble? <laughs> when when is this video going to come out? Well, <laughs> um, okay, but, we can uh, put a disclaimer. Uh, we are shooting this video <laughs> in September. Um, 2024. September 2024. Yeah, that's really important yeah. to say. But, but basically, I'll, I'm going to answer it this way. Before you can say that a market is in, bub- in a bubble, you have to say what indicators you're using. What have you seen that made you think it's a bubble? Now, a price for apart from the price of individual stocks, some of it are in multiples that are like ludicrous and fantastic. When you hear some Tesla. companies. Okay. <laughs> well, now you went there, so let's go there. <laughs> we, we look at TSLA. I know there are a lot of like Tesla, um, Tesla uh, disciples. There are people that are, you know, Tesla millionaires. Hopefully, so I have nothing against uh, Tesla as a company, and I love a Tesla car. I'll drive a Tesla car. That's beautiful. Um, but their PE ratio, which is the multiple, currently is seventy-two. Um, what that means basically is that okay the market is valuing their earnings 72 times basically to if if for instance tesla was a house you own the house 
the house mm. the rental income will take 72 years for you to get your money back the money you put into buying the house and most time people say well it's a growth company is growing and all that but most time people overpay for growth you see that's what happened during the tech bubbles a lot of people bought like companies they're just like sky high valuation they thought that these principles don't apply anymore but some of mm. the, those companies never recovered 20 years later so um there are many companies like that not just tesla but you know tesla is a very well followed stock so my indicator i tend to look at is what we call the buffett indicator so the buffett indicator is usually just sort of like a back of napkin calculation to help you see is the market generally overvalued because you, you, normally when there's a bubble there are multiple companies or multiple investments are overvalued now before yeah. we go into bubble i just want to give an example um recently i shared them um, i sent out a resource a fantastic tool to my uh, mailing list called them um, uh, investment jargon buster and one of the things we defined there was bubble um a lot of times so what is bubble basically when you're looking at bubble there is um the speculative bubble and there's asset bubble a speculative bubble is a spike in asset value within a particular industry commodity or asset class to unsubstantiated levels fueled by <laughs> irrational speculative activity that is not support, supported by fundamentals so basically if you want to interpret it in a very simple way it just means that people are willing to pay f- so so far much so much for mm. assets that cannot be supported by numbers on ground when we say fundamentals we are looking at how much is this company making what is their profit in the next 10 years are they going to make this type of money will this company be that valuable as much as the market is ready to pay for it because the market basically is a if i might uh, quote buffett they say the market is basically a voting machine rather than a weighing machine yeah. so the market might oh this company is the best and we, we all know everyone's how, voting yeah voting don't mean much most time people vote based on the emotions and what they think greed and fear even in real life voting for elections so it doesn't there's not many people are actually going to do like what is a fair value for this company so bubbles did not start today we know about was it 16th century we know about the tulip bubble where people were buying flowers yeah, and it, yeah. up to the point that a flower a tulip flower i think it was a saint augustus or something flower one of them was which had like a genetic problem that made it to become special and rare was selling for far more than the value of a house so that was a proper bubble and there have been many bubbles there's been dot-com bubble there's been different bubbles yeah there's been crypto bubble yeah so currently what i tend to look at is what we call the buffett indicator so the buffett indicator is sort of like one of the things that warren buffett sort of like proposed um so what it does buffett indicator it looks at the stock market as a whole looks at how much stocks are selling and then compares it to you know the U- us gdp basically it's looking at the us stock market basically yeah and it's comparing to the us gdp the economy that is on the line you know that yeah. market the same way that if you come to a company you're looking at their price the valuation what is being sold in the market versus the company's economy which is things like their you know what are their earnings what's their free cash flow you know what are their debt to asset ratio and all that so if you look at Buffett indicator, it's basically looking at, um, I think it looks at uh, the total market capitalization. So if you take the numerator, it's basically the total market capitalization and it divided by the GDP. And currently Buffett indicator is at, at about 199.7% as at today. Mm. By today, I mean like yesterday as at the time yeah. of closing of the yeah. market. So let's just call it 200%. So basically, yeah. that means that the market is significantly overvalued. So based on, on, on that alone, you see that that's quite high. And even if you go and look at um, market capitalization divided by GDP, and then you add like total asset of Federal Reserve banks, that's to look at cash that is being held. It's still about 159%. Let's just call it 160%. So basically... Mm nothing is on bargain here nothing is cheap here you might still be able yeah you might be able to spot companies that are mispriced because the market hates them part of why we are fortunate enough to do so well with meta was that we came at the time when the market hated it so you might yeah. be lucky to buy some funeral homes or, or buy <laughs> buy some you know buy some company somewhere that 
people are not interested in. I told you once when we discussed about funeral home groups that yeah. are making yeah. quite, quite a bit of money, very profitable, but there are not a lot of 21-year-olds or 24-year-olds in Silicon Valley leaving US and thinking, I'm going to disrupt the funeral home industry. <laughs> so they don't have competition. <laughs> and when there's no competition, people can make a super normal profit. <laughs> yeah yeah people, that makes and sense and people people kind of keep dying so they still have like <laughs> that's a constant right <laughs> coffins will continue to be sold i think one question that has been on my mind is the fact that you're teaching this investing stuff right how to pick stocks and all of that and that's very good um but there are some people that are not interested in learning and some people are taking the route of um paying a an inve- a financial advisor or somebody to help them in this aspect what's your take on that is it worth it um to go through those guys or should you just um i i have m- my idea and my answer in my head but i just <laughs> want to hear what, what all your thoughts are in and i think the other part to that question is if your answer is no what scenario is it likely for people to go for financial advisor yeah that's a very interesting question and the answer is it depends um i would yeah. hope that majority of people would actually not be doing active investing because 99 percent of active investors including professional fund managers who do it daily for work underperform the s p 500 which is basically an index fund that you know a cat can pick <laughs> a cat yeah and just pick it and not do anything about it um obviously when you hear okay individual investors like course and people that overperform the s p 500 we're just like a drop in the water compared to you know those managing big pension funds and all that stuff um so basically for instance if i want to invest for my little ones now they are quite young obviously i'll go for an index because they have a longer horizon of investment and at the time i started investing i didn't know what an index was i just put in the individual stocks plus you know as you accumulate a bit of uh, capital you're not you're not you start thinking about risk management more um, yeah. and also they might not be ready to learn and analyze stocks like me and i don't want to keep doing it by, by the time i'm 80 or thereabouts which is <laughs> not too far away <laughs> now the ad- idea of financial advisor it depends what is the advisor doing for you if the advisor is the type that wants to predict the future that tells you that if you buy this stock it will do this to do that you need to run as far as your legs can carry you because nobody knows anything about anything nobody mm. can really reliably i've not seen anyone that reliably no but the but the 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 financial advisor has um done some sort of analysis just maybe not like the way you are doing it but that is what he will claim that he has done oh we've yes. done our analysis don't, this don't is worry. a good don't worry we'll, we'll get to all that scenario so let's say your financial advisor is perfectly reasonable and they they can help you based on your risk appetite they help you to select stocks because they already have a packet of investments most times most financial advisors already have like oh they might call it a fancy name but basically it might be like some index fund some corporate bonds and uh, maybe government yeah. or different things because someone someone two days ago tried to do to do an investment and then contacted me i asked them to look at there's a document called key invest investors document invest, and yeah. he opened it and what he saw there he will see there's corporate <laughs> bond in one country i'm like so <laughs> so so don't don't bother about the names because most time when what financial advisor will ask you is what's your risk appetite you say yes high medium low most people say medium yeah but you don't even know what your risk appetite is part of my class we spend like almost like an hour on risk because there's risk appetite which is psychological like me i don't mm. mind if my stock goes like 50 percent down it's different for different people because i am yeah. not worried so that's risk appetite some people also maybe if their, if their stock goes down 10 percent, they get really worried they sell it so this is all psychological but then there's risk bearing capacity let's call it risk capacity so if i'm 75 years old pensioner and i have all my stock in a company 
like nvidia or tesla and if things don't go well damn i can't go back to work i need to go and find a job in it's Gary. exactly gary is not cheap <laughs> now i need to go yeah we're in the uk do you think you have to buy the guy it's not cheap you might not even be able to drink Gary. Can't. you need to go and work in tesco and you'll be competing with a 19 year old for work and they'll be your supervisor so that's a risk called risk capacity but if mm. you are let's say you are i'm not stigmatizing 75 year olds obviously say if you're 75 and you have like bonds you have stocks you have other sorts of things, okay good but if you're like let's say 35 you're actively working you have income you might even have some other investment i might have rental property and all that your risk bearing capacity might be a bit more you know so you might be able to take a bit more risk so when financial advisors talk about risk sometimes maybe the next question should be for you to ask them which is it is it my risk capacity or my risk tolerance now most people tend to think that they are in the middle so they will say medium risk they will not no, nobody wants to say low risk if you say low risk they'll just buy bonds for you like buy bonds right, yeah that are just fixed that will not beat inflation if you say high risk okay they might you'll be worried that you don't know what they're going to do now maybe they might buy junk bonds for you i'm assuming that financial advisors don't do that um maybe the good ones anyway now if you come down to medium the question is not whether you're medium my medium is not your medium it's not thick yeah. it's not thick that you can say medium rare and uh, well done <laughs> my medium you, you now your medium you might look at what they select in the medium there will be s p 500 and then there might be like some corporate bonds and there yes, will be like and there will be cash there will be and maybe some co- commodities yeah and this is not for you basically so and that's not the main concern here the main concern is like what extra benefit is the financial advice of bringing if there are extra benefits that they are going to do better than the market then we know from the number that most time is not true most financial it's advisors yeah don't even know what happens with your money a lot of time there's a wealth manager there's somebody that is doing the trading financial advisor advises you sells you into the plan a lot of financial advisors are actually financial sales people true i'm not saying true. they are all bad they are really good great financial advisors and i'll show you what they can help you do now if all you are looking for a financial advisor is to be able to pick the right stocks you might as well just go and open an account with one of these uh, stock market anyone that provides index fund etf and buy an index fund buy a well diversified broad low cost low cost is what repeating low cost index fund why because the fees matter if you're paying a financial advice of one percent and I, i've seen financial advisors or all these platforms they're going all around doing financial education and all stuff and they're charging three percent to doctors i'm like isn't this criminal wow. and a lot of those wow. doctors when you ask them how much are you paying they don't know some charge two percent some charge three percent if you're above a million maybe they'll charge you like two percent uh, if you have those doctors how much they're really that is, if... that is more than what many pension providers charge you <laughs> pension providers now they're not telling you that they're actively moving things around they're just like pension is supposed to be dull and unexciting so yeah, yeah. but they have the op- opportunity to charge more but they're not even charging like when i did um the research i think the highest i saw was around two percent or two point something that's which even, is still very high. Still high now if you yeah. come if you come and compound it if you compound it over time i don't want us to do public math but if you go in and plug this into a compound compound interest calculator you might yeah. realize that the fees you pay over your 30 40 years working life might be substantial you might be paying like enough money that could have could have sponsored the expense for a year or two which means you yeah. could have even yeah. retired a bit earlier understand so if your financial advice is going to charge you such fees you need to be negotiating with them the fees you know if you absolutely decide that you need a financial advice and we'll look at some instances where you might need a financial advisor if you absolutely decide that you need a financial advisor then the best option usually i want one that can charge me a flat fee this is what we want to do what is yeah. the flat fee and when you tell us that flat fee we can negotiate it i cannot negotiate it based on my portfolio you cannot say my portfolio is 3 million, 10 million. We negotiate it based on market rate. What will another financial advisor charge me to do this work? 
you know so that way it might that look like it's higher because financial advisors are the good ones they're experts they're professionals they need to be paid you can't just pay them but yeah. if you go in for especially when it's free free is the most expensive and they're charging one percent two percent that's why we've turned down so many financial advisors and money wise doctor because they usually want to you know because we have a lot of people asking for financial advice or mortgage advice or insurance we have people approaching us all the time we've even had one approach us today that we're going to interview later um so that one percent two percent three percent if you compound it over time is a lot so that's one of the reasons to flee from financial advisors that don't know what they're doing now the other, the other reason i'll say is that a lot of financial advisors compared to doctors a lot of people in my audience are doctors they have a different background some of them have got sales background some of them have got business background compared to the doctor or nurse who's got like medical background a high trust mm-hmm. profession where trust basically if, it, if nobody can trust you anymore you're kicked out if they think that you yeah. lied once you're kicked out and comp- and most doctors sometimes don't know anything about money or what is happening they know obviously they make they pay their bills or that, but they might not know things like inflation returns they might do like fine fine chat and show them their returns without checking yeah. what their blind assets <laughs> yeah this i've had these people i've, I've given them to come and talk to me because they, they didn't know what i knew then this was years ago i was yeah. down and i'll listen to them like okay ask a few questions they reschedule the meeting that they will talk to their boss and get back to me and we had like three meetings like that i was just like so basically this is doctor high income high trust this is financial advisor sometimes i'm not saying they are low trust but basically if you think of the most trustworthy person in the world the first person that comes to your mind is not a financial advisor okay <laughs> yeah so it's, it's not a banker it's not a financial advisor it's not a head for those are not the first words that come to your mind and they meet together a doctor low information about fi- uh, finance. finances as an investor high information you don't know about trust there there's a very high incentive for you know obviously they said when money meets experience the experience get the money and the money gets the experience there's a high interest there's a very high chance for you to lose quite a bit of money and that money ends up on the other side if you don't know what you're doing and that's part of why a money wise doctor we kind of like vet financial advisors we vet them based on their qualification based on their previous reviews and how many doctors they've worked with in the past and yeah. what have people said and all that kind of stuff so that's a little bit about financial advice i'm sure financial advisors probably will not be thanking me for this segment but <laughs> again again I, I, the people i'm looking after are basically doctors and healthcare professionals but financial advisors can do a lot for you they can save you a lot of headaches there's a product that you can't really like go and buy by yourself it's like life insurance income protection i really really found it very useful the financial advice i used for my life insurance and income protection he was an excellent financial advisor sat down explained everything to me i already knew it i've already written books and blogs and guides on these things but it, when it's you it's nice to have someone explain it to you yeah yeah ai will never replace some human things so look at yeah. scenarios look at okay what if i do this what if i do that so financial advisors can play that role if you've got a complex situation let's say you have a job and then you have this income and you're moving to another country and then you have like a child who you know probably you need to provide for or maybe you're doing school and you're trying to forecast how much you need another a financial advisor or wealth plan or financial planner could help in that kind of situation let's see an older person and you're beginning to think how much do i really need how much can i spend without running out of money if i uh, uh, you know retire and they're like financial advisors that their job is to give reassurance because one of them i interviewed said um yeah they, they were yeah. trying to come on board a money wise doctor and one of their last clients he had kept reassuring the person that he can stop working now this guy was a private surgeon and the guy was was still very uh, worried so basically financial advisors could do some of those rules these are just some rules that financial, financial advisor can work in together with your tax accountant can look at how to position your money so that you're yeah. not paying yeah. more, more than usual in tax so these are all different things that a financial advisor could do it's yeah. important to understand that makes sense before yeah. you get a financial advisor which one it is that you want them to do for you <laughs> what problem do you want them to help you solve yeah 
Yeah, that that makes sense. I want us to switch conversations a little bit and. You mean less, you mean um, you mean we should leave financial advisors alone for the moment? <laughs> yes, let, let's leave them. Let's leave them. We've. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure they will like the last part. Of them, but, the, the, but, the, the the good ones, the qualified ones, the ones that are doing a good job. You see a lot of people talking about oh S and P. 500 versus global index i know you are not an index funds guy but from what your experience what you know which of the two would be your preference um i don't know if you are invested in index funds but if you are which one are you invested in out of the two of them and yeah, um, yeah basically for like i said for my my children basically going forward everything is index directed rather than individual stocks um for really good reasons um but if you're looking at s p 500 versus global stocks there are a couple of things to consider i had this discussion three days ago with somebody s p 500 is the top 500 companies in the u.s based on market capitalization yeah. So it is one of the most followed index. And when we say index fund beat uh, professional managers, it's S&P 500 we're talking about, okay? Now, there's, the risk with S&P 500 is that the 500 companies are based in the US. So there's country risk there. So you're thinking, yeah. oh, what if the whole US economy goes down and you know somehow the US economy just goes down and the world is thriving, but the US economy goes down. Yes. Because that's <laughs> that's possible at the moment with the current setup. So so S and B five hundred, those top five hundred companies before before we just gloss over it. Let's remember that we're talking about Apple. We're talking about Meta. We're talking, talking about, about global companies. We're talking about you know Tesla. <laughs> we're talking about Coca Cola. We're talking about this Ma- company. Many of them don't even have their headquarters registered in the US in the first place. Exactly. Some of them are over here in Ireland, you know. Ireland, yeah. <laughs> for, for tax purposes, uh, or maybe just for logistics. Probably not for tax. <laughs> <laughs> but but as you can see, these are already global companies. So that argument that is a US base, I don't quite buy it. But for peace of mind, if somebody wants to go a bit global, yeah, one can buy a global index. I don't think it matters too much. The most important thing is that you're diversifying and you're, yeah. you decide to diversify. With the index fund like S&P 500, you might see 500 companies. But with the global fund, basically, I think you probably know global index is a bit better than me. Yeah, some of them have yeah. about 1,500 stocks in them. Um, the two thousand at the minimum. Two thousand, on one pick, five, some even up to six thousand. So exactly, and some of them might be those are buying in Western countries, and some are buying in sort of what you call emerging countries like uh, yeah. Africa and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, it all depends on how much diversification. From my point of view, I feel like S and P five hundred has enough diversification because yeah. diversification is quite okay. Some people, you can argue this point. It depends. Some yeah, people, oh. I, I, I think, I think the the argument a lot of people give towards global index is the fact that it's in recent years that the US has so outperformed the rest of the world, and people will say, oh, if you look back some time ago, it was this country that was outperforming. There was a time Japan was outperforming. There yeah. was a time Europe was outperforming. That this is just US. Um, turn or this is their time that we don't know which country would have performed next so in order to uh, mitigate that risk let's just buy global whichever one comes out surely people that are looking at um, investing for the long term you know someone in your 20s you are going you are thinking of you keep buying stocks till maybe you're 50 that is a good 30 years investing every month you know that argument makes sense but you are right this us companies that we are talking about are also global companies in their sense and them but yeah as long as you are making one of those investments i think you are in safe hands i I feel like whether you buy s p 500 or buy a global index fund it really doesn't make a massive difference because when you go to the global funds what do you see like you see, you, the same. The, you see the same S&P 500, <laughs> maybe up yeah. 20%, 30%, 40%. The next thing I want us to discuss is bonds. Um, I've never bought bonds. Um, I think the only time I've bought bonds would be when I just register in a pension. 
<laughs> and then you pick a, a fund and then you now after two weeks you decide okay let me even go and look inside this fund that i ticked <laughs> on the form when i was filling out my employment details and i just look at it and i'll see 10 15 percent when i'm like 50 <laughs> i i i told you guys to invest in the highest the riskiest investment possible how why am i seeing 15 percent bond here for christ's sake i'm still 30 you see <laughs> these are these are the issues like when they would you think you think people say imagine you are going for higher return you still saw 15 percent yeah bond. now all think about the, it. in all the companies that I think, I've, I've, I've worked in, in i think pension, some some it's, some it's, pensions yeah. have some regulations some pensions are required by law to hold a level of fixed income assets so yeah. they must hold bonds so they must hold bonds which creates some sort of like um, opportunity basically for individual investors some companies are doing well but pension but they are too small for pension funds to invest in or the mm-hmm. government might not allow them to invest more than some fund mutual funds cannot invest more than five percent of their funds in one particular company because they are by law they, they cannot do that so you might find a good company but they can't go and buy it up and increase the price so that's why that's where they misprized opportunities and that's why people like when buffett them got so widely wealthy and that's why there's an opportunity in investing in individual companies but now looking at bonds it's very funny you brought this thing up because most people say I've, i don't invest in this i don't invest in that but they're buying one fund they don't know what's in the fund Mm. basically bonds are just like borrowing money if you lend money to a government it's called sovereign bond or a more fancy name in the u.s is in the uk's guilt so it was based on the paper the gold golden rim of the paper and all that guilt Mm. so basically you lend money to the government the government pays you an interest on your loan and at the end of that period they give you back your money your money yeah that's bond can lend money to a company that's corporate bond some of the companies are high grade and all company bonds are not the same you lend money to apple you think okay well their debt to asset ratio is really low they have nice free cash flow the fantastic mm. company they'll be able to pay me back so apple will say we can only give you two percent or one percent or maybe obviously they won't give you two percent because u.s government bond is a bit higher they might say we'll give you six percent that's if they even want to sell bonds one, yeah <laughs> Now you see another company they they are operating out of a garage or somewhere and they're selling bonds and you're not really sure maybe they are operating in a big company but you know they have shaky financials um and then they'll be willing to offer you 10 percent 11 percent that's what we we'll call junk bonds basically high yield interest bonds because they're thinking they're really quite high risk uh, they don't have a really good credit rating because bonds also have credit rating yeah they don't have really that great credit rating so you should be demanding a higher return anytime you're taking more risk you should demand this is how things should happen rationally this is not how things happen in real life a lot of time people are investing in things with a higher risk and are willing to accept a less return because they don't know any better so now when you look at bonds there's government bonds which is the sovereign bonds there's corporate bonds which i've divided into basically investment grade bonds and then yeah. the one we call junk bond so that's the way to look at bonds but now even when you come to that government bonds all governments are not equal um recently i was uh, giving a presentation where i was talking about how let's say in 1900 or let's say in 1890 if you had bought bonds of the russian kingdom i don't know what it was called whether it's the kingdom of uh, russia or whatever you could mm. have bought the bonds of the kingdom of great britain at the same time and they might not have been too far in terms of their future forecast and you may not have been able to see that in 1914 there was going to be a revolution in russia there was a war mm. and everything and then ussr and your bond have would have been not much what better is. than a, a wallpaper <laughs> you might as well just use it and do like a, a nice quality wallpaper just put it up there compared to the uk bond that might have still be viable so this is one thing bonds the value depends on the ability of the person to pay now bring it mm. to the current uh, not to in the last 60 years or thereabout i think there has been 151 countries have defaulted on bonds so i laugh wow. i laugh Wow. I laugh. I laugh when people say. I've heard people say bonds are the safest investment, and I've heard people who are like they say I've been investing for thirty years. Bonds are the safest investment, and now a pensioner, and I'm just praying for them that the bonds they've invested in 
there's no issue so that they don't have to come out of their retirement and come and pick up a job maybe wow. in tesco or somewhere packing grocery so bonds basically if you go and look at the history of bonds there are some very popular defaulters argentina has defaulted quite a few times um <laughs> uncle russia <laughs> russia <laughs> defaults every now and then mexico has gotten a lot of bond traders to leave their job and become used car salesmen because basically they think that oh this bond is undervalued they're buying they're buying then the thing blows up if the government does not pay i think recently was in nigeria that the government said they were i was i was praying you will not mention nigeria <laughs> nigeria, <laughs> nigeria has technically never defaulted on a bond Nigeria has technically never defaulted on the bond, but if you look at it practically, there has been times when they had all but defaulted. Then there will be things like structural adjustment program, where the World Bank will come and say, okay, so that you will not default, you have to tighten economic this, do this, do that, do that. Yeah. And recently there's been a bond, I think they were supposed to pay last week. I, I've forgotten whether they said there were technical issues. So I didn't quite follow up to know what happened. So the main thing to know about bonds that you're lending somebody money, you want to know that they can pay you back. And yeah. the truth is that the more the ability of a person to pay back or the perceived ability of the entity to pay back, the less likely you'll be getting a high return. If, for instance, the gold standard is US Treasury, US government bonds, they tend to, you know, so you might be able to get them 5% or 4% or 1%, sometimes it's less. So basically, like last week, the Fed came out with the interest rate. So they come out yeah. with interest rate. The same thing in UK. So basically, you need to understand what is the current environment. If um, US government treasury bond or UK guilds can give you 5%, then that means that any other investment you are doing, you should be comparing it to that and asking for a better mm. return. So if I'm going to invest in, let's say someone say, I want to build, um, I'm building an estate, I'm raising money, can you give me 200 or whatever? uh then i'm going to check okay you're going to give me five percent why why don't i just give the money to the u.s government i, I think if u.s government is unable to pay me they'll just print some more money and all of us will have our currency diluted but i'll get my money back somehow you know i'm not saying that their printing money is great but quantitative reason is not fantastic but they have yeah. somehow they can pay and if they can't pay they can increase taxes there are so many things they can do they can and, do and, yeah. and sadly some people have said in the past some people would even invade another country and get money to pay their debt. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what U.S. government does, but uh, I'm just saying that they have many, they have many ways they can pay you back compared to your your friend that is building an estate and if they are never mm. to pay you back, they're not. <laughs> U.S. government, I'm just playing. <laughs> so, so um, I hear you, but a lot of popular advice out there, and what you said really makes sense right hmm. they say that when you're going towards retirement switch from stocks which is high risk to bond so that you'll be able to sleep well at night in retirement are you saying that that thinking is wrong or if you want to do that just buy the um sure bonds like the us and the uk and all of that and even the uk if you remember what happened does it early this year or last year and um, just before the tourists went when they were buying back um a lot of a lot of their bonds just so that um the whole market doesn't turn on his head or something like that so i i i, I want to just get the rationale like when people say those things are they do they mean oh just buy the u.s um treasury bond or at, at that retirement phase because that is usually the advice that a lot of people give um and I've, i'm not close to retirement i don't i'm still at the building phase everything i'm doing is still stocks but right now with my thinking i'm still thinking like even at retirement do i really want to buy bonds that's what i'm asking like what is exactly is the place of bond and maybe how how do you do it well yeah i mean basically it goes down again to personal finance is personal yeah i mean i see like a 75 year old who's still like 90 percent in equities and 10 percent in bonds um but the general rule of thumb there's a rule of thumb that financial advisors used to co use use call the 100 minus age so if you're mm. if you're 30 years they'll do 100 minus 30 
so they will suggest to you to put 30 percent of your um portfolio in bonds and then 70 percent I, I reject it <laughs> <laughs> I, I i think it, it just it just sounds very safe financial advisors most uh, mainstream advice would be things that nobody can fault them for and yeah, uh, true. they're like true. If, if anything goes wrong it's sensible advice right they say it's sensible yeah. but will you really get ahead with that compared to the fact that you're working this long term period um yeah. so if you if you're 100 minus x like age is like if your age is 40 so 60 percent on, on, unless unless if you have like 20 million and then um, what you need to leave is less than maybe one or two percent then that advice makes sense yeah on a yearly basis i mean that's why personal finance is personal if you're just working yeah. and you're getting like 30k 40 50 or maybe less than 100 it might not be a, the advice for you but let's say you founded a company at 25 sold it at 32 and you have like maybe 50 million in the bank and you're really really worried because you've come from a really poor background you have a morbid fear of ever becoming broke so you might just buy bonds with let's say 30 percent and that way you are sure that okay if that bond even if you have bond let's say you have like you have 10 million in bonds and if those bonds can give you five percent every year so 10 million yeah. not to do public math again but 10 million if you divide i think that was about hundred thousand times five yeah five hundred thousand yeah. which you can live on most people can live on and be fine so that might be it and then you know that you've secured that bit and you then you can do whatever you want with the rest of your money go and do some venture capital do whatever you like um but for most people i think it doesn't sound unreasonable to start reducing your stocks and going into bonds when you're nearing retirement because the thing with the stock market is that if your ultimate goal is that when you're nearing retirement you sell some or you sell most sure. yeah the market could go down market can go down and stay down for years if you look at the market crashes that have happened if you look at uh, for instance 2008 i think started yeah. recovering around 20 2009 2010 in, in, in fact there was a chart that i saw that people that stay investing in 2007 2008 i think even up to 2009 didn't see any I mean, people that were investing every month didn't see any positive return mm. on their investment until like after four or five years. Yeah. That was when they saw like the um, average return for the whole time they've been investing became a positive. Exactly. So, so, so yeah. ma markets move in cycles. And if you invest in stocks and then when you're retiring, sadly, it's when the stock market crashes yeah um wow, it, might, it might be quite a difficult a retirement. big blue yeah yeah you might need to push your retirement a bit further um but if you are closing to retirement the idea is that you can start reducing your exposure to equities and start moving to fixed income assets but there's yeah. a popular saying that you can either eat well or sleep well so if you <laughs> <laughs> you can't have both you can't have both if you want to eat well then you get exposed to higher risk equities and all that yeah. stuff and maybe you might eat well but you will you sleep well i've been i remember when at some point i was actually trading derivatives this was after i finished my gp training many years ago and it was popular and i was sort of like shorting shorting the crypto mm. market because ba basically i wasn't like investing massively in crypto but I was like okay like there's an opportunity here because people really believe that this is this coin that i think is worthless i don't mean bitcoin i mean like some random nonsense yeah. Yeah. coins. and people are buying it i'm like this is a like big opportunity so i started short selling it so i'll borrow it and sell it borrow it and sell it borrow it and sell it make quite a bit of money i wasn't sleeping you know i wasn't sleeping so i was eating well but i wasn't sleeping well i'm like this is not good for long term you know and people yeah. might say they will do trades, they will put on stop loss and all that nonsense. Yeah. But you you will still when you wake up in the morning, what are you going to do? You're going to take check. your trades. <laughs> Compared to me now, like if I make an investment, I may not look at it. I may look at it quarterly or quarterly. Mm. Uh the same thing, if you come to bonds, you say you want to invest in stock market, that is great. That is beautiful. Even if you're just buying index fund, people don't just remember that index fund is still stocks. If you decide to keep investing in stocks, then you might eat well. 
But if yeah. you decide, oh, I want to sleep well, maybe I don't. I may not get that good returns. Maybe bonds will give me three percent. But you know, I want to reduce my this. In basically, that's that's where if a good financial advisor could financial help ad- you. Financial, I was I was you, about to say that yeah. exactly because sometimes financial advice might also include some sort of like therapy, <laughs> not therapy, <laughs> per, not therapy per se, but you know, basically walk through what is it really that is important to you because what is important to you yeah. might be i don't want to run out of money or it might yeah. be that i want to be able to leave a nice sum of money for my family but at the same time i don't want them to be whacked by inheritance tax so they might guide you exactly. through what yeah. you need they to do they might, they might suggest sell do you, you want to sell the house and share the money to your family now and you know there is a gift amount you can give out in the yeah. while you're still alive so Basically, yeah, these yeah. are the areas where the mechanics, the nuts and bolts, that's a financial advisor and help you at a reasonable awesome. fee. <laughs> yeah, so you are, you are spot on there. I think for me, when I think of financial advisors, that's where I see them coming to play. That's 10 years to retirement for most people. That is when you should start thinking of considering one. Or maybe you have an unusual situation like um, maybe someone in your family just died and give you uh, <laughs> 10, you 10 million 10 million dollars <laughs> and then you have a big problem to think about <laughs> then uh, you um, can call um, them um, to eat um, some maybe, out of it or maybe you've got properties <laughs> in a different company and thank in, you in yeah yeah so, so yeah just time but these scenarios 70 80 90 percent of the people watching will not be in this scenario so that's why we give that advice i think another area that a lot of people watching would be um in that scenario would be the issue of pensions and isa um for example of course you know i'm married to a doctor mm. you are also a doctor so i'm going to use a lot of the medical the the medics as an example okay you see a medic working as maybe a gp a salary gp or something earning um let's say for example fifty thousand fifty thousand pounds in a year okay and then the gp is also doing locum for example now that salary is tied to nhs pension that i, I don't even know when, when when do when do they have access to it i think it's like 60, 68 68 so, right so, yeah so, so, so 65 the state pension 65 is for the um 2008 2000 session yeah for the 2015 session is 68 or, exactly or it, it could be state pension age anyone that is um later that's later. what you get to get so which is quite a long way off <laughs> you, you can't expect a doctor to, to keep walking up to and who says it won't be pushed um further again well if the life expectancy is go up which yeah it most likely will will be the case so there's a poll i put on uh, my linkedin for my you know some people in my audience says will the nhs pension age keep rising so the nhs pension scheme has changed over time 1995 session pension age was 60 or 55 for special class 2008 section pension age was 65 2015 scheme pension age matches the state pension age or 65 whichever is later so with talks of further changes nhs staff are curious last year 75,000 nhs staff left the scheme and since then we've seen a huge spike in our visits to our website basically people of moneywisedoctor.com um obviously yes. we also own a uh, doctorpension.com a few other sites that are still in the works um so people have visited and they've been asking questions so in the poll now, the answer the options are one yes it's inevitable b is no they wouldn't dare and c is i don't care not a member now there have been uh, 53 votes so far can you guess the percentage that voted yes it's inevitable just a wild guess 91 percent you're very close 94 percent Wow. 94 percent of medics voted yes it's inevitable 94 percent and nobody voted that they wouldn't dare zero voted they wouldn't dare and uh, mm. maybe six percent said i don't care i'm not a member is it is it is it a case that um i think i would like you to 
push out this um, survey to more doctors because it might just be a case that the doctors that read your post are more financially savvy than the average doctor out there and it's they quite, know that it's quite possible it's quite possible yeah i mean this poll will end in eight hours so i imagine that by the time i sleep i wake up i'll publish the results and i might be able to get a few more people to to take the poll but it yeah does... I, I think i think if you can think of how to push it to um maybe one of your other doctor groups so mm. these are just general wide doctors i don't know what mm. the name of some of them but we've spoken about some of them before if yeah. you can publish the post there so yeah, that we... you just have a more can i even tell you that yes we have published in one of those groups and uh, we've got a few more feedbacks that are still following it along those lines. There's those lines, it, okay. You know, the the sample, let's say if you if you try to get a wider sample, you might maybe there might be a change, but basically the results are basically quite the same. I think maybe those following me on LinkedIn probably voted a bit more. But let's see. Um eighty two percent voted yes, it's inevitable. Wow one percent voted no they wouldn't dare and zero percent voted i don't care not a member and then somebody added an option to the poll called <laughs> maybe <laughs> and 17 percent uh. voted maybe so basically it tells you that the average i'll, I'll say this 17 percent if i take that 70 percent add it to the 82 percent roughly mm. it's like 90 99 basically yeah. so it, yeah. either way you look at it it shows you that at least 90 percent of doctors think that Expected. there is a possibility even if they're not happen. sure they if someone says maybe that means they know that there's a probability yeah may 50, i add 50, a high probability actually that the it, will, it, it would happen so yeah. it, if it doesn't happen i'll, I'll be surprised so if you are they saying money if you are thinking fund. that 68 is high just remember that at some point it was 60 that people were taking their pension yeah at some and point it was 55 i didn't even know that yeah so it's probably going to get to 75 i think at some point yeah yeah so yeah this is what it's so is. yeah but i i think the question for those that are in defined benefits how can they structure their retirement planning and things like that i know that's where isa comes into place private pension and all of that what are your thoughts around that i suppose the first place we'll start with is i wouldn't rely entirely on nhs pension or any government pension at all they are nice to have and i'll take full advantage of them if you have them obviously as you know i no longer work as a salaried doctor or anything like that so i don't i'm not i'm not part of that pension anymore but basically, if I was the NHS pension, I think it's quite a fantastic pension, defined benefit and all that in terms of, apart from the money you get, there's debt in service, ill health and all that thing in NHS pension. But in addition to that, we tend to suggest to doctors might start thinking about things like your private pension, like self-invested personal pension like SIP. There are lots of good ones around. I think I've done a video comparing all of like the ones that have the lowest fees yeah. so this is really quite important um sip is one option but there are other tools you can use for your retirement planning like the lifetime i saw so the lifetime i saw you can actually use it for buying your first house or for investing for a retirement saving or investing for a retirement and with the lifetime i saw obviously you can open it above 40 so say life does not start at 40 so lifetime i saw does not start at 40 <laughs> I and i does, think your contribution stops at 50 or something your contribution stop at 50 so you, you can't yeah. contr you can't join after 40 and even after you've joined you can't contribute after 50 but you're eligible to pull it at 60 yeah. before the nhs pension so th this is one thing that's why it makes sense to use a multi-pronged approach you know exactly. so if, if you yeah. have a lifetime isa and you're putting up to the maximum four thousand per year and you're getting the extra government bonus of 1k and let's say you started doing it at 30 or 35 so you've got 15 years if you're not using it to buy your first house you've got 15 years and in that 15 years they're putting like four thousand pounds every 
every year so that should work out to around is it like um 60k or thereabout fees are important always check the fees um one could also say that if you felt that lifetime isa wasn't very reasonable you could actually use it just as a saving tool you can just yeah. save in the lifetime isa if you decide that your cash position you want to build up a healthy cash position towards your retirement, retirement which and, is also a very good plan yeah so something you should factor in yeah. yeah cash is part of the the game so if you have like four thousand pounds going to a lifetime isa and the government is giving you an extra one thousand pounds per year and you started at 35 so you're getting like five thousand times um 15 years so you're talking a nice seventy five thousand pounds cash position so that in itself might help you retire a bit earlier actually if you think oh, i have this cash position yeah. and it's not your only investment you still have your isa allowance of 15k you can then decide yeah. well since i'm doing this with cash i'll go aggressive on stocks on the other side so you can take the 15k of course this is not uh, financial advice we are just starting <laughs> <laughs> for anyone watching it's not personal financial advice you have to think about your own situation yeah your situation but, but, yeah. but this is a combination of things. there's self-invested personal pension of course there's tax benefit with it the government can allow yeah. you to put up to sixty thousand pounds per tax year yeah tax or 100 percent of your income whichever is um, lower um so there's sip there's isa and of course there's nhs pension and state pension so that's i'm i'm, I'm very sure would be cancelled <laughs> why why are you so sure well there's a state pension but why 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 would it be cancelled looking our, at the data looking at the NIA data is not is not sustainable it, that's that's the problem it's not sustainable but what, what, we'll what, see. what is worrisome is when um you know if the government keeps collecting tax for something and then suddenly say they can't pay for it so like, that is that is so, the dilemma so will we, 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 the pension go away will the tax go away or and what or about the one? some sort of some sort of refund exactly so it's just uh, mm. it's just funny yeah. we'll, we'll see we'll see how it plays out we'll, definitely we'll see we'll see any last words yes i'll say basically when it comes to uh, planning your financial future you can't leave anything to a chance it doesn't mean you have to become a financial nerd or guru but you need to know the basic stuff so you cannot just give up your future or give up control for your future to a random financial plan or somebody somewhere you need to take an active participation ask the right questions and uh, obviously if you need to read a book read a book if you need to attend a seminar attend a seminar if you want to follow a podcast like the wealthy post follow a podcast is, is weekly or thereabouts so that you can increase your financial iq because at the end of the day you are the one in charge of your financial future yeah thank you so much and then um, for those that are looking oh i want to be a part of um dr Grimm's course that we mentioned earlier at the beginning of the podcast and I think, if I'm not mistaken, the this current cohort, if I'll call it that, is closed, right? But it's, it's closed. you should <laughs> you should go and subscribe to his YouTube channel or his newsletter. I think if another opportunity will be opened up, um, you definitely send out an email. So we'll put the link to the newsletter in the description for anyone interested to subscribe and, and wait for that opportunity but it's been a very wonderful conversation as usual i hope you've learned one or two things from this um conversation and until next time see you all right thanks for having me bye bye